Hi and welcome back to my classes. I'm Heather Murray and I wanted to share with you today a technique that is kind of new to me and that there was a time where I couldn't uh, throw away my paintings. I had to keep them forever and <laughs> hope that one day somebody would claim them. Um, but I've realized since then that paintings that I don't want any longer can take up a lot of space. So I really would like to find a new way of giving them a new life. So my way of doing that is pretty simple. Um, I alter them. I change them, I alter them, and I make them into a new painting. This might seem like blasphemy for some artists, but for me, I really love the idea of giving a painting a new, new shot at the world <laughs> and maybe a new home. So um, what I would like to do is show you a few techniques today and walk you through typically uh, my process in how I would accomplish this. And um, I hope you'll enjoy this and I hope that it'll offer you some bravery to do the same thing with some of your paintings that no longer are loved. <laughs> okay, so let's get going and get started and start making some changes. My first line of action is always to find images that I enjoy. It's important to find something that I appreciate in order to, to recreate my new painting. I really liked this painting initially when I painted it, but something about it just didn't stay with me. I was thinking maybe the fantasy level just wasn't doing it somehow. I like the idea of children on a deer, but maybe I'm the only one that feels that way. So I experiment with cutting out various images to see how they work. Um, I, I'm probably going to remove the children from the deer. So I'm trying to visualize just how a new figure might connect with this particular painting. Um, and I have a couple that I really like. So I'm just putting them on the painting to get an idea of whether that, that would be the one that sticks for me. Um, I'll worry about eliminating other elements later. I like all these figures very much, like a couple of them are more playful and have more of a vintage uh, fun feel. And the I think that there's merit in that. I don't think a painting has to be serious. Um, my, my take on this one with the two children was not serious. So that's an example of that. Um, so here's the last one I selected and actually this is the one that I I ultimately chose because I think she just she really reveals a story in her face. She's a beautiful there's a beautiful pose. She's a she's a great child with a poodle skirt. It just for me works in many ways. Um I just enjoy it a little bit more. I could have used any of them. Um you can see I've I'm showing you a few pictures where I have altered other paintings. Um, you'll see that there's layers underneath. Um, for people who know my art, they know that I don't worry about that. I like the idea of texture in the painting. So while you're thinking ahead about this, I want you to be thinking a little bit about texture because we have this idea with art that it has to look very perfect and very flat and nondescript. And I, I tend to challenge that notion because I think there's really a lot of value in adding texture and making, um, adding maybe even a little mystique. So here I am, this is kind of hard to do for me sometimes, <laughs> to remove the figures that I originally really appreciated. And um, yeah, I'm not worried about how it'll turn out next. I'm more worried, I just feel a little bit bad because I'm taking away almost like their spirits. <laughs> but the good thing about it, as you know, as an artist, you always probably should record your art. And so if you have the original image, you always have that image, it's yours. So even if you don't have it on a substrate like like canvas or wood, you still have the image that you can use in many different ways, maybe on a card or, or who knows. But anyway, you've, you've got it for posterity. So what I'm doing here is using my favorite material, 
for coverage, and that's just plain old white gesso. And I'm layering over the areas that I want to change. Um, ultimately, I'll be painting over this too, but I need that base in order to make the changes. It looks pretty messy at this, this stage, but believe me, after a while, it gets better and better. <laughs> and really, I could paint over this, but I like the gesso to be on pretty layered. Um, that also takes away some of the edges of the paper. Uh, once in a while, I'll try to rip part of the um, portrait off, but you may risk pulling up the canvas or, you know, damaging the art in some way. So if you can, if you can feel peaceful working with the old image being embedded there, then just as this is the way I recommend. And what I'm doing here is just to define the back of the deer a little bit because it's really hard to sometimes figure out what you're doing. Unless you give it a little bit of guidance. Um, I like to do the background sky as well around the antlers because I was getting ready to lighten up that sky anyway and it's a good opportunity to add the gesso to blend in the background a little bit where where you've also done some of the coverage over the faces. So I at this stage I don't know how much of the white I'll leave in the background but I, I think it's wise to start to um, cover over that gesso uh, and cover over the areas that are needing to be changed. So I work a little bit on the sky, a little bit on the land. <laughs> you can do a lot with gesso. Um, and I'm, later on I'll probably fix the horizon a little bit too because I'm not satisfied with that. Um, it's really kind of like a disappearing act. You try to find ways to blend the background, the foreground together, as well as around your images, just to keep a uniformity happening. Um, sometimes I'll even add a little texture more texture with the back of my brush or the brush itself or the amount of gesso I use just to again kind of um, help that background image to disappear and you can see where I've put some um, it's just gesso on the, the deer's back at this point but pretty soon I'll add more to that as well um, the land as well adding a little gesso again uh, I can always color it up later all of this is for the whole the purpose of blending. Um, as you can see, it's also giving me a better idea of how the deer will look on its own without the image. Oh, and there we have it. Um, here you can see I'm adding a little bit of. It's um, I use a china marker or a marking pencil. A lot in my paintings because it it gives you a nice textured line and it stays with the paint so here I am working on the horizon and that also will pull things together a little bit more too as for the the deer itself um, I'm I'm trying to stay pretty much in the family of colors uh, that I used originally, um, using a lot of um, browns and umbers. Um, and I'm actually being a little bit more lighthearted about how I apply it. Um, here and there I'm adding little little bits of light and brown. Um, as you can see, I'm marking around the ears with the marking pencil just to define that a little bit better. See how it's pulling together now. There's still a little ghostly in the background of the children, but we'll we'll deal with that. <laughs> There's my marking pencil. And here's the girl. 
So I think she'll look pretty awesome together with this deer. Um, there's something about her expression that is really charming and, and it really seems to work with this whole notion of a child standing beside a, a deer in the countryside. Um, she's strong, I like that. Um, here I Here is more gesso being layered on and it may seem tiresome, but this actually really works. Gesso has a nice, almost a clay-like tendency too, that you can uh, build it up really nicely. And you might just want to step back and look at it and come close again and look at it and uh, let it dry a little. Um, I'm speeding this up for the sake of the class, but I would generally wait a lot longer in between for dryness. Let's blend, blend, blend. That's really what we're doing. And being a little bit playful too. There, there's no strict rules to this. Um, you're going with what appeals to your eye, your artist's eye, as you're doing this piece. When you're doing clouds, you might just want to play a little bit more with your brush strokes, blend in a little bit with your, with your, in my case, my finger, or sometimes with a paper towel or a sponge. Um, again, lots of texture happening. I don't know if you can hear it, but I have my dog, uh, Gracie, in the background and she's snoring. So hopefully that's not getting in the way of your experience too much. <laughs> I don't like to wake her at this point. She's so blissful. So it may look like there's a lot of white in the sky, but you'll see when we pull back how how it does actually work for this piece. You see, there's, a, there's still enough blue in the sky, like blues and tones of gray. Sometimes if I find it looks too pop up or too pretend, I will, I will mix in a little bit of gray, gray with my blue tones. Um, so, for those of you who know about my um, style and, and mixed media and applying images to the paintings, you know that I use a little bit of matte medium. The gel medium is the one I prefer, the, the heavier gel medium, on either side of the, uh, both on the image on the back um, and also on the substrate. So we get a nice firm grab I'll also paint medium on top of the image as well to help to press the image down further. If you're using the heavier photo matte paper or matte paper, you shouldn't get very much buckling with your image. But if you have that problem, it's usually resolved by really laying on evenly the matte medium to both the surface of your substrate as well as the back of your image. And you just keep working it down till you get a nice flat grab. I don't know why I decided to focus on this brush here, but I think I was trying to be a little arty or something. <laughs> something like that <laughs> anyhow I'm looking for a little bit of pop in this picture too so red is my go-to color for a little bit of pop in the middle of it and I think the red would really make this girl stand out so I'm giving her a red cardigan um, I'm painting her very very carefully um, around the edges I can always dab it off a little bit again with a tissue or, or a piece of paper towel and water if I'm feeling I've gone too far. But use your brushes depending on the area you're working in. If you're working in small areas, 
tiny, tiny brush. Um, you're, I heard at one point from someone, you're only as effective as your, as your tools. And um, I try to keep that in mind and keep my brushes, my fine brushes in very good shape. My larger brushes, not always. They take a lot of abuse with my matte medium. Um, you'll find that with matte medium, it's not very forgiving in terms of coming out of brushes or, and definitely not coming out of clothing. So, so please dress accordingly when you're doing this kind of work. And I don't use a lot of, I'll use a tiny, tiny, tiny bit of red or coloring for lips and cheeks. I tend not to overdo it. I, I've learned from my errors in the past that it doesn't need a whole lot. Um, I'm looking at what different colors to paint her skirt. Um, I'm using a little bit of um, more of our warmer brown tones for her skin but again not too much just a little bit here and there to do and to follow the shadows that would be my main suggestion when it comes to faces less is more um, you can either paint a little bit in the highlights or paint a little bit in the shadows or a little of both but don't try to smoosh your paint around the whole face and cover it it really won't look as real if you do that I, I at least like the effect of maintaining some of the integrity of the original image because, you know, I could paint over it completely, but what's the point of that? It's already giving me a guide to follow. That's usually one of the areas people get most nervous about is doing skin tones and um, flesh and covering faces. And I would say just do very, very little. If you see a little white highlight, give give the face a highlight. If you see a um, you know a cheekbone or a shadow that you want to follow, do that. But don't don't paint the whole face in. Um, and with this skirt, I just again wanted a little more color, and I I just played around with my blue tones a little bit, kind of a deeper turquoisey tone. Um, if you notice, I don't usually say I use a specific color because I'm always blending and I would encourage you to do the same. Blend your colors, learn how to blend and, and get the color tones that you like to use in your pieces because every artist has its own their own favorite um, shades, tones, um, hues. And for me to recommend a particular paint in a particular color, I'd say that's really, that's not my aim. My aim is to give you some guidance at how and, and demonstrate how I do it. But I would like you to find your own sensibility and find your own way of using some of these techniques and making them your own. Um, I appreciate, for those of you who pay attention to the our, our class page on Facebook, it's really, um, it's really nice for me to see when people all the work I, I really enjoy seeing. I, I truly am. I'm honored that you're participating in this class. But the other part of it is sometimes there are a few that stand out because they've taken a few more risks and added a little bit more of their own um, personality and style. And I like that a lot too. So bear that in mind. Um, you, you don't want to um, necessarily emulate me. You want to do something that you can put your own stamp on. Um, and again, just more more gesso. Um, I've used I use a little tiny bit of parchment in this too, just to kind of, because there is some parchment in the background. So I'm adding that a little bit to the gesso to give it a little bit more, so it doesn't completely look like snow. <laughs> I'm in the depth of winter right now making this video, and. Um, I think it's influenced me somewhat, but nonetheless, I think it's good to uh, to be able to break it up a little bit with some parchment or or whatever you whatever tone you like to use in the background. I really like my figures to pop up, so t in other words, if I put a dark dark background, and I have done this before, I've started dark, 
and I've stayed dark and then in inevitably I end up altering the painting and bringing it to light again. So here we go. That's pretty well it. Um, I'll probably do a few finishing touches, but there you have it. It's, um, it's a lot of fun to do this and very gratifying. I suggest you do more of it in the, in the future.